the supermodel who was just on the cover of Harper's Bazaar Vietnam this month. She founded the first ever conservative fashion and lifestyle magazine that's very couture also created the 28 wellness app. It's an app that allows women to coordinate their cycles to their grocery list, their fitness routines, and even their food that they're eating. I absolutely adore her. I followed her on social media for years, and now she's here to talk all things culture, relationships, hormonal birth control, basically, her tea on being in the modeling industry as well. She's worked with virtually every celebrity and supermodel, and so I ask her a lot of questions about behind the scenes tea. She has bumped shoulders with some of the most famous women in the fashion industry, loves America, lives counterculturally, and of course loves all things health and wellness, which we're gonna be talking to her all about. Make sure that you're subscribed, you're following, you're leaving five-star reviews, all of the normal stuff. Please welcome Brittany Martinez to The Spillover. Rolling Stone recently called Evie Magazine the Gen Z Cosmo for the far right. I mean, I feel like far right these days just means in shape and happy. So, I mean, we're not far right, but that's like the new term for it. It was just the whole Rolling Stone interview was so funny because I had found out from writers who wrote from us like two years ago that she was doing this hit piece. So I DM'd her on Twitter and was like, hey, like you should talk to like employees or former employees or maybe someone who's written at least three articles for us and like it'll help you out with your piece. And she did interview one employee, but the employee said that we were so great to work with and, you know, she was having trouble with infertility. And so she's been fostering kids and we've been really lenient on that. And uh, none of that made the cut. None of, of our course. current writers made the cut. So. It was very interesting. And then she ended up going viral for one, encouraging Taylor Swift to date a so-called Nazi, apparently. I don't know this dude's backstory. Uh, so she was called a racist for that. And who, then who was? This journalist from the Rolling Stone. So all the black people on Twitter were saying she was a racist. And then all the conservatives were saying she was supporting child porn because they found this article she did years ago where she said it was okay. It could be okay to have child sex dolls because maybe that would make a pedophile not act out in real life. So basically karma was sort Karma of got her. I call it the curse of Evie. <laughs> you come for us and like karma comes for you. It's so bad, but it just happens every time. You went from winning Elle Magazine's model search and modeling for global brands to creating a conservative fashion lifestyle empire with Evie in 2018. What did you see when you started modeling firsthand that other female oriented news outlets were really lacking when it came to speaking to young women? Well, first we did start in 2019, not 2018, but what I would see is kind of the truth. So, you know, you go to LA, everyone's drinking their juice, green juices, eating their kale salads, going to Pilates before it worked. Like everyone was obsessed with being like thin and like attractive and they're all white and want to be hot. And then you read their articles in body positivity and you're like, um, you guys get mad if you gain five pounds, like you're Regina George's, but then meanwhile, you're promoting all this unhealthy stuff to everyone else in middle America. So, you know, you, you learn from the top, like makeup artists and health and nutrition, and you just know everyone. So, you know, a lot of it's full of it. Like I went to Harvey Weinstein's party 10 years ago before me too. And girls came up to me and joked, oh, if you want to get famous, sleep with Harvey. And everyone was laughing about it. I was like 19. Um, maybe it wasn't 10 years ago, but, uh, yeah. So this was like normal there. And then they like came out and they're like, oh, me too. Like nobody knew and it. It's just, you know, stuff like that, that we knew. So we wanted to be honest. Were you ever worried that trying to launch a magazine via print and online was a risky business move today? Uh, we never plan on doing print, honestly. Uh, but we just had so many people ask for it. So we ended up doing it and luckily we've had great success with the print issues and they've been so much fun to make but yeah that was our original plan was just digital how do you even do this though start a magazine like out of nowhere like where do you find writers where do you find photographers because this is the thing about evie it is so beautifully done it, it is like couture fashion oh, <laughs> luxury this is high quality photography it's not like this podunk you know, yeah. I'm going to make a fashion magazine. Like, it's really good. Thank you. Uh, my husband and I are very picky, so uh, he'll be happy to hear that. But 
I think like the photographers like I've known for years after modeling. So it's like, it was kind of a great fit. And then as for like the writers, we just scouted them from other magazines. And then eventually people just start coming to us every day. Do you remember the first article that you guys had posted that really gained traction for you online? It was, I mean, it was either the Candace Owens interview, obviously, because we did a photo shoot for her and she posted that. Um, and then we did one on, is your boyfriend effeminate? That got a lot of traction uh, for good and And what did what did the article say? Do you remember? Like, what are the signs to look for to see if your boyfriend is effeminate? There's like four different types of effeminacy. So there's like sexual effeminacy, like, you know, on Twitter or whatever, they're like, oh, you're a man if you slept with 100 girls, but you're actually effeminate because you can't control your sexual urges. So there's like that. There's intellectual effeminacy where you're too busy. <laughs> I'm like trying to be politically correct. Don't. I'm, I'm talking, okay. Say anything. You're intellectually masturbating, right? Because every girl you're looking at, you're lusting over? No, no, that's sexual effeminacy. Oh, okay. This is intellectual. So it's just, you're you're too busy trying to think of the why versus a man who's a good man is like, okay, this is the answer. This is how I got there. And he stays at it. Like he rests in it versus like someone who's philosophizing all day long. You just mentioned that you went to a party with Harvey Weinstein back in the day, yeah. before Me Too. Who are some of the famous people that you've brushed shoulders with in modeling work or acting or whatever? I've met literally everyone. My first ever modeling job was with Amber Heard. Um, oh, and, and how was that? The truth. The truth. The truth. Okay, so she's she's a bit older than me. Um, I was a finalist in a model search and she had won like a few years before. She was just getting a lot of fame. And I remember thinking she was so beautiful, uh, but I, I'll never forget the makeup artist came in and they said, who wants to do makeup on this bitch because I'm not doing it. And I was like, wow, these people are rude. You know, I'm from Texas, Idaho, whatever. And I'm in New York for the first time. I'm like, whoa, this girl must have made them mad, but she was nice to me. So I don't, I don't know what she did behind the scenes, uh, but it's kind of funny to see her, you know, now. What, <laughs> other, tea, that happened. what other tea do you have? I mean, I've met everybody. <laughs> It's just like, how, how many people am I going to, you know, call out? <laughs> Anyone uh, top of mind? Um, I'll say uh, this famous person that we probably both don't really like. I'm not going to say her name. I didn't sign an NDA. I met her before she was famous. But uh, she was probably the meanest person I've ever met. And I'm not surprised that she's psycho today. Uh, but the majority of people I've met have been really nice. Taylor Swift, super nice. Zendaya, super nice. Um... Selena Gomez, I haven't met, but she dated one of my friends and I've been to parties and weddings with her there. Um, but I've never talked to her personally. People that are that caliber of A-list, like Selena Gomez, when she's going to things like a wedding or whatever, do they kind of like try to stay under the radar or are they she, enjoying themselves? They have like the big hat, the big sunglasses, which is funny because it's always like a small, you know, situ like situation. Like the birthday party I went to was like, you know, 30 to 50 people maybe. The wedding was like super intimate. I will say this, the rudest celebrity that I have met, um, and actually it was two, actually, maybe three times, two of them were an interview, one was just a meet and greet, was Demi Lovato. And this rings true to who she is today. She sucks. She is the worst person on earth. So rude. Doing an interview, she give, she would just be in a bad mood, so she'd give one word answers. Yes. No. I don't know. Maybe. Like, doing that on purpose. Yeah. Uh, when she knows that my job is to try to get you to talk. Right. Yeah. I, I've even had friends who have met her, and, um, you know, I've, I've told them, like, oh, this is, like, you know, who she is, and... They're like, no, I don't believe you. She's like the best thing ever. And then they like met her and made her things and she was still like mean to them. Well, I remember also in her, even in her meet and greet, a time when I wasn't even interviewing, it was just to meet and have a picture. And I've done these with Taylor Swift. I've done these with Selena Gomez. And it's always, they'll pose with you. They'll put their arm right. around you. Demi made her people tell us, you need to stand arm's length apart. By the way, years before COVID. So this isn't yeah, like, yeah. it was just, she doesn't want to be yeah. too close to you or touch you. And it's, she's not going to say anything yes. to you. You take your picture and you walk away and don't talk to her. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. Back in its heyday, when Victoria's Secret was the end all be all when it came to modeling, what were you hearing behind the scenes about what it was truly like for those girls? Uh, it's such a long answer. I know so many of the girls. I know so many of the photographers, so many people involved in there. I did hear the Epstein was at almost every show. Um, a lot of people didn't know who he was. He never like did anything, obviously, with the huge girls. Um, but he was there at every show. 
It's such a mix because like Erin had, Aaron, oh gosh, I can't remember her name, Erin Heatherton or something. She was oh, yeah. one of the models. Yeah. She was so muscular, but had such an amazing body. And what happened is like partway through Victoria's Secret, somebody else came in who wanted the super thin waif girls. And before it was more like Tyra Banks, like Heidi Klum, like they were slim, but they were like size fours, like 90 supermodel bodies. Slim fit. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they would kind of bash them or like tell them like, you're not that attractive or like you're too fat or whatever. Um, but the majority of the models had a really good experience with them, but there definitely was some, I think in modeling in general, you know, I've had friends with the top agencies in the world and they're like, oh, just eat vegetables, you're too fat. And now they're all body positive. That's why. <laughs> I have so many think. questions about the, just the, the change in culture surrounding fashion and modeling. Would it be fair to say that the majority of celebrities and models are as woke as the fashion magazines that they appear in? I would say the majority of the VS girls are not very woke because a lot of them are not into the body positivity. A lot of them were ticked off when Ashley Graham was on the cover of Sports Illustrated when they're like on their workout routines with their diets and they're just like, what the heck? You know, she's eating pizza and being on the cover of Sports Illustrated and we're not getting it. They feel um, like they're cheating the system. Yeah, but they're they're not going to come out and say it. But I would say almost all the supermodels are actually not woke. Um, but most actresses, I would say, are. Can beauty even still be considered a main export of the fashion industry? Currently, no, but I think we're having a revival to it. I think we always will. Humans love beauty. We love beautiful sunsets. We love beautiful people. We just, you can't go against it. What have you noticed, I mean, and what has Evie noticed that young women are gravitating towards online as far as content goes right now? Like what types of topics, conversations? Yeah. I mean, they love beauty. Like they're really into it. I think a lot of them, I think Gen Z is more polarized. You either get the very, you know, very out there or like very kind of return to traditional more so than millennials were. So it's, it's kind of a mix in that way. I feel like Evie has really led the cultural conversation and change topics that come to mind for me breast implant illness yes i feel like you guys are really the first to start bringing attention to that uh at least recently yeah hormonal birth control you guys are doing a great job talking about that also i remember during the pandemic you guys were some of the only people talking about how the jab was affecting breastfeeding mothers yeah we were the first people to negatively call it out um at the time i was pregnant obviously i'm pregnant again but uh, my OBGYN said, don't take the vax because we've had a record number of stillbirths. And I said, is there any way I can get this information? She said, all the OBGYNs have it in South Florida. And she said they wouldn't give it to us. So there was a lot uh, going on with that. It's like, you know, you don't know for sure. So it's like better to be safe than sorry. Has there been anything that you guys have talked about that got you in a lot of hot water or you guys regretted talking about? No. Yeah, the Rolling Stone tried to make it sound like we deleted all these articles because we were just so upset with how we covered COVID, which we were actually super happy with how we covered COVID. Um, but we had erased articles like 500 temporarily because we had the rebrand of the site. And a lot of the photos were super old photos that were like not aesthetically there. So we deleted like the first, I think, year or two of um, articles. And then our editor was like re-uploading them, but it takes forever because that was like First she was doing grammar and everything, and then she'd have to like go back and do the photos and everything. So it just took a while. Uh, but it was just funny, the Rolling Stone article made it sound like we deleted it as soon as we heard this Rolling Stone article was coming out, which like, you know, that just logistically couldn't have happened. I love the angles that uh, you guys take on relationships with Evie oh, as you. well, because I, I feel like it's very countercultural than what you see when it comes to relationship advice from other big lifestyle fashion magazines geared towards women. Do you think that you marrying your high school sweetheart has to do with the lens in which you talk about relationships and marriage? I mean, I'm sure. I love marriage. I think it's the greatest, greatest thing I've ever done. I would have done it, uh, you know, immediately if I could have. So even though we, we did get married young, but I would have done it even sooner if I could have. Tell me the tell me the story about how you guys met because this is fascinating to me. I'm thinking of the school dance. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, the school dance. No, that that came months later. Um, but we had met. I this guy came up to me and was like, "Is your name Brittany Martinez?" And I said, "It is." And he said, "Okay, you're invited to this party." So I go with one of my best girlfriends. We go to this party. Uh, I meet my future husband. He's there. 
and his other friend is there and they were the only guys like not drinking or doing drugs. And he was just the first guy I had ever met who was so confident, would say what was ever on his mind. Like I, I joked on Twitter the second time I ever met him, I was eating shrimp and he came up to me and said, those are the bottom feeders of the ocean. And I was so embarrassed because I'm like, oh, he thinks I'm nasty. I'm eating shrimp. But uh, I always appreciated that he was just so honest. Uh, but at the time he had a girlfriend, so I didn't pursue him. I ended up uh, winning this modeling thing and going to Brazil for a week and then coming back and then finding out they had broken up. And uh, it was like a long few months thing and it was just, it was super magical. But I went to go see him in a play. Uh, he's not an actor at all, Rolling Stones. He was like trying to be an actor, which is not true, but he was in a play once. Um, so I went with a girlfriend to go see uh, him in a play and he didn't know I went. He didn't even know until after the tweet. He was like, wait, were you talking about me? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> he was like, were you talking about me? He's well? like reading it at first and he's like, what? What is she talking about? And he didn't realize I had like gone to see him in the play before the dance. So then I went home, got on my best dress. Like I was like hoping I'd see him and he was like working the front desk. And I remember he told me I looked beautiful and I was, you know, like you're like, I was so ecstatic. Like he's the only person that would say something and it was like, you know, game over. Uh, and he said, make sure to save a dance for me. And we all had these dance cards where guys would come up and they would write like they want to do the waltz with you or the tango or whatever dance. So I walked in with my girlfriend and guys came up and they're like, hey, can I put my name there? And they would like put their name. And then when he comes in, he like comes up and he like sees my card. And he like is kind of puzzled by it. And he just like scratches everyone's name out and just puts his name down the line. Uh, so I would dance with him the whole night. And it was just it was amazing. He's. He's so romantic like that, I don't know. How old were you guys when you actually got married? Uh, I just say young 20s, but okay. yeah. There are a lot of commentators right now on the internet that are saying things like, if you don't get married in your early 20s, you're basically worthless, it's a lost cause for you. Even though that has happened to you, you yeah. did get married in your young 20s, you disagree with that sentiment, why? Because I know the people that are doing it are doing it just for engagement baiting and they're totally trolling. Like I know they don't actually believe that because they're all older than 25 and they're not married and they're not dating anyone. Like it's all just total bait for clicks. Do you think that the majority of women now are wanting to get married later? Most, I would say most of my friends in middle America where I've lived has, have gotten married earlier in their 20s. And then most of my friends in LA, New York, have gotten, I mean, they're not married, they're in their early 30s or late 20s. So I think it just depends on the city and what they're doing for work and, you know, it's just mixed. I don't, I don't think that people should be rushed to marry someone that they don't like. Like I didn't wanna fall in love so quickly with my husband, but like I met him and it was game over, but I wouldn't recommend it just for the sake of being married. True or false, women hit the wall at 30. <laughs> I mean, false. <laughs> Like, it, it's just like, it's all so bizarre. And I think it's a um, kind of a counter to feminism. Now where men are so angry at women, now they're like, oh, women, you know, are have the sexual power and have their looks. So it's like, they're trying to like degrade that and stop that because they're, I think they're just hurt from years of dealing with women that they don't like. And it's like a counter thing, but it's not, it's not good. The battle of the sexes is just, not good. It feels so unbelievably imbalanced now. And it was, they have a point when they gripe about where third wave feminism took us as a culture, but now it's almost shifted to, to they're the ones driving us into the ground. And I'm talking about the disgruntled young men. Yeah. So like with women, it's one thing. And I don't think that women should, you know, fall into feminism or whatnot, but like when men do it and go on the opposite extreme, there's something so effeminate about it because you you want the men to be the ones like, no, like this is the rightly ordered thing. This is what we should do. So when you see the men kind of falling into their version of feminism, there's just something so effeminate about it. It's like worse somehow. It's and it's like gross. a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like none of the, all these girls are hoes. Nobody wants to like actually get married or whatever. Well, you're, propelling that to happen by like even talking like that or saying that to every woman you meet. Yeah, yeah, I know. When you're like all men are trash, you get the trash men. When all women are hoes, you only run into the hoes. Like I just, I just saw like the most absurd 
tweet the other day. It said like, there is not one girl under 25 who uh, doesn't have OnlyFans and hasn't gotten the vaccine and uh, actually wants to get married or something like that. And I'm like, dude, I know thousands, thousands. It's got to be engagement bait. There's so many. There's so many. I mean, I would say like the majority, I mean, maybe half my friends were virgin still marriage. Well, Logan Paul just got engaged. He's like yeah. 28. His supermodel girlfriend is like 31. My mom's two years older than my dad. Charlie Kirk's wife, Erica, is, yeah. is a few years older than him. And I think Candace Owens, too, is like a couple years older than her husband. It's, it's, it's not bogus. that serious. But you know what I think? All of a sudden, this obsession that uh, I think we're having as a culture with health and wellness I think we're gonna get back on track to women aging more beautifully because we're going to start eating more non-toxic and all this kind yeah. of stuff. My, I have a friend who's 38 and a friend who's 36 uh, and they're both like drop dead gorgeous. Like, and if, you, if they told me they're 28, I would believe them. But I was going to say too, when you talk about fertility, like if you're getting married to a 22 year old, then have at least six kids then if that's like your goal but if they're saying women hit the wall at 30 like at 30 you can still technically have like six kids at least if you're super healthy yeah so i don't know the whole thing is strange like if you're if you're trying to have eight to ten kids i totally get it but uh most of them aren't caring for eight to ten kids so you brought up fertility i just i listened to this podcast this week i'm so obsessed with it I, i'm pretty sure it's like number one on the charts um and it's about this yale fertility clinic they had a nurse who was stealing the fentanyl that the patients were supposed to get during their egg retrievals. So it was like over 200 women were victimized by this woman because they're in, you know, unfathomable amounts of pain with this egg retrieval for IVF. And this woman is, they're basically giving them salt water, saline, yeah. instead of actual fentanyl for the procedure. Anyway, oh it's this gosh. massive like expose podcast on how this happened and, and the Yale Fertility Clinic is being sued now. Wow. And I just feel like this is another thing that is, this is a winning culture point to talk about the, yeah. the problems with the fertility industry and how women have been victimized and used and abused that both, no matter where you fall politically on the left or the right, this is such an interesting and important topic, just like birth control. Right. If you bring up hormonal birth control dangers, uh, tabling at a university as a pro-life group right, right. now, you're going to have pro-choice students coming up and saying, I do agree with you on this. My friends that were liberals were the ones that introduced me to the book, Beyond the Pill. They were all getting off the pill. This is what, I mean, the Rolling Stone and these journalists say they don't understand, maybe they do, but when you go to the Hamptons, when you go to Beverly Hills, when you go to LA, like those girls are the most health conscious people ever. Like they're not putting GMOs in their body, but they're gonna put a vax and a pill. Like those girls are the last people to do it. So that the whole thing has been, this interesting swap of kind of the right being more anti-vax, not anti-vax, but you know what I mean? More like kind of in that holistic when the right was generally more doctors and pharmaceutical. Why and now is that? Why are we seeing this switch? I think it's the media. I think the liberals are still, a lot of them are on that side because a lot of them would call me and be like, hey, like, you know, the supermodels or my friends in LA and New York, they're all like, hey, I'm really against this, but I don't want to come out and say it and sound bad. So I think the problem is people just or lacking courage, honestly. Would society as we know it be able to function without women? Because no. allegedly, yes. Allegedly, <laughs> women the are useless and <laughs> society would just go on like not a hitch, not a bump in the road without Men us. would not be inspired without women. We are the muses. We have inspired men from the dawn of time. Otherwise, you know, it's not good for men to be left alone. What do you think about spouses having close relationships with people of the opposite sex? I think it depends on the situation, but I personally didn't um, because after dating my husband for a little while, all my guy friends came out of the woodwork that they were in love with me and whatnot. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm not even obviously into them, but I don't want to be friends with someone that I know that if I offered to do something with them, they would accept. Like, I would just rather be around estrogen. Would you be concerned if your husband said, honey, I'm going to lunch today with me and a close girlfriend from college. It would, yeah, I guess it would just be like weird. Like if it's an employee or whatnot, like I, I don't see an issue with it, but like, 
I, it just sounds odd. You know, I always say, my, life. my red flag is this. Anytime I've dated a guy who has friends that are close girls, I always know if they're a threat and if they have ill intentions, yes. if I'm never invited. So if they're inviting my boyfriend, like, hey, let's catch up, let's go to dinner or let's get drinks or whatever to catch up. And they don't say, and by the way, tell Alex she's welcome to come. I'm like, you have bad yeah. intentions. Yeah, no, I agree with you. You're right. We know girls. We know girls. Guys don't know. Guys don't know. They fall for a lot. It's kind of funny. Kind of sad. What is wrong with men describing themselves as high value men and women describing themselves as high value women? Why is that bad? Okay, it's kind of like when you're when you hang out with someone who's very rich, when you hang out with a billionaire, he's not like, oh, I made this much money today. This is how much this couch costs. This is so much. When you're talking about how high value you are, you are, it's a LARP. Like if you're high value, everyone sees it, everyone knows it. You don't need to talk about it. So it, it just kind of feels like, oh, you're like, the guy who doesn't actually have money, but you wear the Gucci shirt, you know. Because this is all over TikTok. These guys, yeah. like, I'm an alpha. Yeah. I'm a high value man. I've Are never you a high heard value woman? An alpha say that he's an alpha. It's That's exactly so what I think. bizarre. An alpha is not going to say, I'm an alpha. Right. Because he commands Because he room. just commands. Like, yep. you know, and you're like, okay, I respect it. What concerns, if any, do you have with the trad movement among the right? Again, I just think it's all a LARP. Uh, my mother-in-law is probably the most trad person of all time. She lives on a farm with the goats, makes everything from scratch, like doesn't like microwaves. Like she's like trad, has no One internet. She, yeah, she is like trad, trad. Um, and all these trad LARPers, I feel like, one, most of them aren't married. And then two, if they end up getting married, it's usually to like, the guy that literally no other girl in the world wanted. And you're like, oh, okay, like, cool. Um, and then it's like, if they were actually on a farm, they wouldn't know what to do. Like, they just want the Pinterest aesthetic version. They want to wear the dress, they want to hang the linen, like, but they're not thinking about picking up the goat poop. If you're actually trout, I respect it, but I wouldn't know it because you wouldn't be on the internet. That's what I always say. Yeah. These, okay, this is my number one pet peeve about this. There are these women who go viral on Twitter who are who are always talking about, uh, you know, women need to be doing this. Women should be doing less of this. This is what a, a really good woman does. Yeah. Are, they're just constantly on Twitter harping about yeah. this. And I'm like, how good of a wife are you? How good of a mother are you? You are on Twitter all day You know bitching. what the funniest thing about all these girls are? I've noticed they're either divorced, like almost all of them are divorced, or they were like dumped by a fiance. Like they were always never the first choice of a man. And it's like, the, it's like some sort of like, it makes them feel special to be like, look, I'm this like wonderful girl. But it's like, if you were that wonderful, like, you know, none of this would have been happening. And they just like spend their days like hating women on Twitter. And it's just for what, you know, I think, I think a lot of them like wasted their years and have like a lot of regret over it. And it's just- In kinda... which I think, you know what I think, Brittany, I think that's more relatable and admirable to say that. They don't want to be relatable. They want to put themselves on a pedestal, but they should try to because there's no like, I don't know, like every girl I know who got married in her young 20s and has an amazing relationship with her husband isn't attacking other women on social media. She's like killing it in her life, just being an incredible woman. So it's just, you know, it's interesting. What are some good dating discernment tips? Like red flags to look for, green flags to look for? I mean, I posted a tweet the other day. I think you got it. Here's the thing, like before I met my husband, I had a list of everything I wanted in a guy and granted I was 16. So, you know, you, you can, Okay, I made one of these lists too. And you know what's on my list? What? Uh, he would hug an orangutan with me at the zoo. So I think, I think 30 year old Alex's list is different. The older you get, the pickier <laughs> you get, the more specific you get. When you're like super young, you're, you're not thinking that, you know, big yet, which is the naivete works or, you know, doesn't work depending on your situation. but. Mine was basically like has good parents, has good relationship with his siblings, same religion, uh, good values. What if a guy doesn't have a good relationship with his family? You think you should rule him out? Not necessarily. Look at like Tony Robbins or someone, you know, his mom had like 10, five different dads or whatever, but you can't necessarily rule them out. You know, I was like, this is my list. I just want to keep it safe. And um, obviously I would miss out on someone like that. Were female bodies created for the male gaze? Technically, I think they were. Um, because we came, you know, if you go back to mythology, if you go back to the Bible, that's misogynistic. <laughs> you came from Adam. Okay. The first, the first thing, okay. If you're just looking at Genesis and you're just looking at it logically, we come from Adam and he says, that is good. Like the first thing that ever happens in a woman's life is she is judged. 
which is why I think that women have more of a, oh, don't judge me, like a fear of being judged because that was the first thing when we came on this earth is we were judged by a man and told that we were good. So yes, I think women's bodies are for men and for ourselves, but I also think men's bodies are for us, so it's okay. And that's the thing, like also, if you're, you're bringing up a biblical perspective, when you talk about like the flesh becomes one, right. your body is his, his body is also yours. Everybody, exactly. Everybody always, when they talk about this and how misogynistic the Bible is or Christian relationships are, they always leave that part out. Yeah. it's, it's it's kind of like the whole, for some reason, we were, we were talking about this the other day, um, the men's obsession with like a submissive wife. And it's like a good man, you automatically respect him and do what he wants. Like no good man is saying, submit to me, woman. Like it's odd. I see but. these guys, I th see these young, oh, talking about uh, these like, I'm an alpha male type guys online. They literally say things like that, like I, I run a militant household and my wife is submissive. Like this I, yeah. is the stuff they say. Why I, do you I, say that? It's weird. I to know me. people like that, and it's usually you know the wife isn't submissive and they want it, but they're not respected by the wife enough to get that. And also the next verse in the Bible, if you're actually going by the quotes you're talking about, is that the man should die for the woman as Christ died for the church. So it's like. The woman is supposed to submit, but then the man should be willing to die for his wife and his family. But they always conveniently leave that part out. Always. Yeah. They always leave that out. And I'm like, okay, if I'm looking at this, those are the two things. I'd much rather be in the woman's position. You know exactly. what I mean? Like, I'm like, the men, the men have. The men have it harder. Way harder. Oh, yeah. You're the founder of the app 28. Yes. Which is my favorite Aww, wellness app. You. Swear to God, I tell everybody to download thank it. I feel you. like I was I was week one when it came out downloading Aww. it. It tells you what workouts to do, what food to eat, what groceries you should be buying based on what phase of your cycle you're at. Talk yes. about why you created this and, and the whole story behind it. Yeah, we always want to create a whole media empire like from Evie, stemming from Evie, and I know it's not technically from Evie, it's a whole separate brand, different employees, different investors. I know they try to link it, but it's a completely different. The only link is you. The only link is me, um, uh, me and my husband, I guess. But we had heard for years, like women struggling with him world, uh, hormone imbalances. And like, we have known for years, like all the top supermodel trainers. And they're like, we've been doing this for years. We told the girls to get off the birth control pill 10 years ago before it was cool because it was like wrecking up their skin and their body and their relationships. So, um, this is something that people have been doing for years, but it wasn't mainstream. And we realized a lot of people being on the pill didn't realize how their cycle worked and you can only get pregnant a few days a month. And like, people just didn't grow up learning that. So we're like, okay, let's, teach it, let's help people eat the right nutrients, get their insights, workouts, depending on when they are in their cycle, what's best for them. And I mean, people that have used it, one of my friends lost like 15 pounds in two months, like one cleared up her skin, like one had easier PCOS, like better, like dealing with cramps. Like we've had so many women just reaching out to us on TikTok and everything, having such great results. So it's been really, really nice. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. So I have been called out in the last month um, by outlets like Media Matters, NBC News, saying that me talking about the dangers of hormonal birth control is right-wing extremism. There's some secret agenda that has to do with us being pro-life or whatever. For me, this could not be more nonpartisan to me. Right. There is nothing right-wing about this. No. It is just empowering women just and women. women's health. Yeah. How do you feel about this, uh, you know, sudden trajectory of, of a lot of women on the conservative side talking about hormonal birth control? So I'm, I'm glad women are uh, learning about it because from the beginning, women have been lab rats in the whole birth control experiment. I don't know if you know the four original pioneers of the pill, but it's Margaret Sanger, yep. obviously founder of uh, what came to be Planned Parenthood. Uh, there was Catherine McCormick, who is a super rich liberal woman whose husband was a schizophrenic. He died, left her his estate. Uh, and they were both older women, like in their 70s. There was Gregory Pincus. And this man was a uh, scientist who did in vitro lab experiments. He was like this huge hit at Harvard. They loved him. But then he ended up, instead of publishing his work in medical journal, going to the press and being like, oh, this is what I'm doing. They eventually just got rid of him. They were like, this dude's fringe. We don't want anything to do with him. And then there was John Rock, who was a Catholic OBGYN. So Margaret Sanger. Wait a minute, a Catholic guy helped yes. start so, hormone birth control? But Catholics are historically very anti-birth control. Yes, and that's the reason they picked them because the Catholic church is like against birth control for moral reasons. But this guy, so Pincus was Jewish 
And he was like, I need a Catholic on board too. I can't just have a Jewish uh, person on board because you know the Catholics are against it. But if I can get a Catholic for it, it'll be okay. So what they did was Margaret Sanger wanted a pill that let women have unlimited sex whenever they wanted. But then as soon as they got off the pill, they would be able to get pregnant again. So Pincus, who was this fringe scientist, nobody like talked to him anymore. He knew like progesterone, the hormone that women make when you're pregnant, you can't get pregnant. So he would inject it in rabbits and rats and they wouldn't be able to get pregnant. So they're like, okay, how can we inject this in women to not make them get pregnant? So they're like, let me go to John Rock, this Catholic OBGYN. And he was dealing with women with infertility issues. So they're like, okay, why don't we inject progesterone in the women that are infertile and he's like well wouldn't that make them more infertile he's like well no let's try it because maybe we project it uh inject it and then after we get it off they'll be able to have kids so they did that uh but those women weren't having sex um and then they went to a mental institution injected in men men started getting feminine characteristics they started shrinking their testicles um their voice started changing the men were like we're over this pill we're not doing it so then they ended up going to puerto rico and they went to San Juan, this really poor area, and the women there just thought it was this great pill from America. Like, they didn't realize it was a test. Like, it wasn't fully developed. And also, Margaret Sanger had her eugenics worldview and plans, and so she also loved the idea of going yeah. to Puerto Rico because she's like, let's get these poor, poor brown women, you right. know, sick. And some of them died. Some of them died during these yeah. experiments with the pill. Yeah, and they didn't know it was an experiment. And like back in the day and with science, like you didn't have to sign a waiver or anything. They, just there was, thought, they were not given any side effects yeah. of what could happen. Yeah, so it's like, and then they ended up after giving it to say 60 people, um, they ended up not using people will be like, oh, they don't actually use progesterone in the pill. They don't, they use progestin, which is a synthetic form because progesterone comes from an animal hormone. So it's like, it would be so much more expensive. So they use progestin. But the thing about progestin is it's more likely to give you cancer because progesterone is what your body naturally makes. And if you breastfeed as a woman, you're less likely to get breast cancer. So they took it out, made it synthetic. Um, so then he goes, and this is the crazy scientist who's always going to the media. And he was like, brave new world. One day we won't need men to get pregnant. Like he was very ahead of his time in that way. Uh, and they ended up getting it approved by the FDA in 1957 as a menstrual disorder pill. So it wasn't as hard to get as a birth control pill, but it was like side effects may include you not getting pregnant. So the whole thing was like really seedy uh, because it was illegal uh, based on the Comstock Act back in the 1800s, it was illegal to have like contraception. So everything they were doing was illegal. That's why they went over to San Juan and experimented there. And then in 1960, they made it uh, FDA approved as birth control. But at the time, like I said, there were like 60 people that they did everything on. And at the time, John Rock, the gynecologist was like, I don't want you to like call it out here because it's not ready yet. Um, and then there was a study in Denmark in 2016 where they did a study with over a million people. And like, I think 30% of the women at least were suffering from depression, more likely to commit suicide. You're, two you're, two you're twice as likely to commit suicide on the pill. Yeah, but it's like from the beginning, it got approved with like nothing. Like it was based on like nothing. And we still don't have any side effects on fer uh, future fertility after the pill. Like we don't have any. So it's like, is it gonna affect people later on? Like I know people have gone off the pill, they immediately get pregnant. I some know some people that can't. We don't actually have studies on that yet. That's what's crazy. What was so infuriating to me is that when NBC News wrote this article a few weeks ago, they reached out to me. They said, would you like to make a comment? Because we asked this OBGYN uh, about, you know, is the hormonal birth control pill actually dangerous? And she said, the side effects that you experience on the pill are no different than the ones that you experience while you're pregnant. And my immediate response was what you are experiencing on the pill is synthetic. Right. It's also- It's synthetic hormones. Women are on the pill most of the time for decades at a time. Yeah. Pregnancy is very temporary. You're experiencing you know, these mood swings and, and whatever you're experiencing while you're pregnant. That is for a very short amount of time compared to how long women are on the pill. The pill was never supposed to be something that women took for decades like we are. We just, yeah, we didn't know. Like none of that was out. It's like, it was the first pill ever that 
healthy women could take daily, ever. And also, it was it was the liberal feminists who first rang the alarms in 1970 at the Nelson Pill hearing saying, why are you guys not giving us the side effects? That's why we get yeah. our little pamphlet of yeah. side effects, whatever. But nobody's opening that thing. It's the size right. of, a, of two right. newspapers, you know, yeah. pinned together. And a lot of times, like, they don't always tell you. It just depends on your doctor or OBGYN. Sometimes it's like, oh, you have acne. You should just get on this pill. And it's like, they might not even know all the side effects. It's so different. It's like, pregnancy is so different from everyone. The side effects from the pill are so different on everyone. It's just, you know, hormones. You're a model, but I would say you're also an entrepreneur. I would say, yeah, probably more an entrepreneur now. Yeah. I used to model full time before Evie. Now I, you know, I keep getting pregnant, so I don't do it as much. What advice do you have for other young women who see something lacking within the conservative movement? Um, you know, maybe like, I wish that we had this, um, or a business that's moving. What's your advice on them if they see something that they'd like to create? I would say get a good mentor, have really good taste, and then support other people that are doing the same thing or trying to do similar things. Um, I always try to go out of my way to support small businesses or friends that have small businesses because, you know, conservatives all day will be like, oh, we need to like have more conservatives in media or film and whatever. It's like, why don't you take money and fund the next Taylor Swift? Like, why don't you have money and like fund, you know, pay $9 a month for Evie or like whatever, subscribe to YouTube for politics. Like, you know, there are things you can do if you actually want to support good movies or media that isn't gonna, you know, be counter to your values. What is next for you? Is it is it something that you're doing for 28? Is it something you're doing for Evie or a totally new business venture nobody knows about? Um, Evie, we're working on our next print issue. Uh, so I'm really excited about I that. I am so excited. I look forward Thank to you. the print issue of Evie. It is so stunning. Thank I you. have both issues that I keep on my coffee table in my living Aww. room because they're so gorgeous. Like I won't get rid of them. Thank you. Yeah, if your audience has anybody that you guys want to see in the magazine that you just absolutely love, let me know. I always love like taking suggestions. And by the way, you have interviewed you know, actual supermodels, actual celebrities are in, in these magazines. This is not just like people you've never heard of. So tell us right. about some of the people that you've interviewed and done stories on. Uh, we did one story on Gina Carano. That was back when this, actually, we tried to interview her before she got canceled, literally the day before. <gasps> She's like, yeah, let's do it. And literally the next day she gets canceled. Uh, and we were like, oh, wow. Uh, we were not expecting that. Um, she is probably the sweetest person I've ever met in my life. And I know that I am, you know, have an affinity for martial artists because I did martial arts for years and uh, she did, I think, MMA. But uh, literally probably the nicest girl you've ever met in your life. And what they did to her was so sad. And I'm just, I'm still angry at whatever his name is who plays the guy, Joel, in uh, The Last of Us for not sticking up for her. She didn't say anything bad. Like, she doesn't say anything bad about anything, anyone. Is it Pedro or something? Pedro, whatever his name is. I cannot watch him. And I get so angry because I'm such a gamer. I was so angry that he was Joel. Um, I'm still angry about it. But it's just like, when you're friends with someone that sweet and that good of a person, like, how dare you not stand up for her, especially as a man? Like, I don't know. People don't, people see dollar signs and they don't want to give it up. I know. I mean, that's what it is. It's just selfishness. It is. Like I said, so many people aren't woke. Like you'd be surprised, but you know. Okay. So how much does it cost to use the 28 app and how much does EV cost and where do you find these things? Yeah. So the 28 app is free or if you get the premium with the nutrition, it's 89 a year, I believe. Um, EV, oh my gosh, <laughs> how do I not know my prices? Um, I think it's 799 a month if you do annual and i think it's nine if you do monthly and month is because be you guys are posting tons and tons of articles a day it's access to being able to read every all the content and stuff yeah you're like paying for the employees like you're paying for everyone on the team so when people are like why do i need to pay it's like well how are businesses going to make money because ad revenue is much lower than it was prior to covid that's why like new york times and bloomberg and all these sites i subscribe to you have, they have a subscription a yeah where do you find ev online and where do they find you to follow you don't worry about following me, but you can follow Evie on eviemagazine.com. Brittany, thank you for coming on The Spillover. Yeah, thanks for having me.
if you liked this episode, you're really gonna love an old episode I did in season one. It was episode 18 with lipstick, heels, and a baby. It's called The Secret World of Fashion Influencers. And then also a couple episodes after that, I talked to two women who had shows canceled with HGTV for being conservative. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you, mean it, bye. Oh, <laughs>